Assalamu alaikum. alaykum. Welcome to the briefing room. I'm your host, Awawa Hamza. The tensions between Somalia and Somaliland has been on everyone's mind for decades. There are many things that are disputed between the two Somali nations, but everyone agrees that the atrocities that occurred in the 80s in Somaliland at the hands of the government of Siad Bere are to never be repeated. Now, at the most recent talks, the Somali federal government admitted in the press release, or stated in the press release, and I quote, We share the pain inflicted upon the Somali people by the military regime in Somalia before the year 1991. We condemn all the atrocities committed by that regime throughout all Somali people, particularly the people in Somaliland. Now whilst they may condemn the atrocities and share the pain, you have to admit they have chosen their words carefully. This was not an apology, but I'll repeat, this was not an apology, it was an acknowledgement. The Somali federal government is yet to apologize for the mistakes of its previous administrations. But, whilst all that's happening, and while those talks have been happening for the past two years, there's also been another development occurring that impacts this. That impacts this whole particular area. And it was happening across the other side of the world, in the US. There's something called the Torture Victim Protection Act of 1991, and I'm just going to call it the TVPA from now on. And it allows US citizens and non-citizens in the US to file civil suits against individuals, whether they were acting in the official capacity for any foreign nation who committed torture or extrajudicial killings. Now, what the plaintiff has to demonstrate is that they were unable to resolve this using the justice system where the alleged crimes happened if they are adequate and available. Now, the act itself was passed in 1992, and the first person to use this was a Roman Catholic nun by the, by the name of Diana Ortiz. She filed the suit against former general and defense minister Hector Gramajo of Guatemala, arguing that by his command authority, he was responsible for her abduction, rape, and torture by military forces in Guatemala in November 1989. A federal court in Massachusetts ruled in her favor and awarded her $5 million in damages in 1995. Now, fast forward nine years, November 10th, 2004, the Center for Justice and Accountability, headquartered in San Francisco, they filed a complaint with the US District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, alleging that another defendant had command responsibility for extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention, torture, and cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment crimes against humanity, as well as war crimes carried out by his subordinates during this period. Does the name Muhammad Ali Samatra sound familiar? If it doesn't, it definitely should. Muhammad Ali Samatra served as Vice President and Minister of Defense of Somalia between the period of 1980 and 1986, and he was also the Prime Minister of Somalia between 1987 and 1990 coincidentally being the first person to hold that post since he had better to control in 1969. So it shows how important he was. Now in June 1988, whilst he was still the Prime Minister, the Somali government's war against the SNM resulted in an all-out aerial and ground assault on Hargeisa. It, everyone knows about this. The attack struck civilian neighborhoods the hardest and it leveled most of the city. Over 5,000 residents were killed, but many reports say that the number was at least quadruple that. Now, Muhammad Ali Samatur, who now lives in Fairfax, Virginia, he is the defendant in this case. So who are the plaintiffs? The first is Bashir Abd Yusuf, who was a young businessman in Hargeisa at the time. In November 1981, he was taken by government agents, accused of being part of a subversive organization, taken to a detention center, and tortured repeatedly over a period of several months. Now, amongst other things, the main thing that he was being sued for is that the torture included electroshock treatment and waterboarding. Now, Mr. Yusuf was repeatedly tortured and, and interrogated and told that the torture would end if he confessed to anti-government crimes. He was eventually convicted of, a member of membership in an illegal organization, and he spent the next six years of his life in prison, almost entire, entirely in solitary confinement. Now, he fled Somalia soon after his release, and he arrived in the United States in 1991. So that was Bashir. The second person is Barala Saleh Mahmoud. Now, Barala and his brothers were detained by Somali government forces in 1984 and then convicted of collaborating with the SNM. The sentence was death. Now, he managed to escape, but his brothers weren't so lucky. 
they were killed in a mass execution with approximately 40 other men. Now the third appellant in the case is Mr. Aziz Muhammad Deria. Now it was during the June 1988 attack on Harkaysa that Mr. Deria's father, brother and cousin were taken by soldiers at gunpoint. He never saw them again. But he heard from released prisoners that the three were executed. And in the same month, the last plaintiff in the case, Mr. Ahmed Jamal Guled, who was a non-commissioned officer in the Somali National Army at the time, now he was arrested along with other soldiers of his clan and transported to an execution site. They were all shot by a firing squad in a mass execution and dumped in a mass grave. And I don't know how he did it, but somehow he survived. And by some miracle, he managed to crawl out from beneath a pile of bodies and escape to safety. So now we know who brought the case and who the case is being brought against. And you know the arguments for it. Now let's have a, leap, uh, let's have a, a deeper look into the case itself and check how Samatra was involved in all of this. Now surely, a commanding officer can't be responsible for everything the soldiers do, if it goes against what they ordered, right? Wrong in this case. In an interview with the BBC in, 19, in 1989, Mr. Samatra admitted to giving the final order approving these operations. Prime Minister, yesterday, we had a call to our office, admittedly from people that you might call dissidents, and they say that last year's total mayhem, chaos at Hagesa Airport, was a result of operations ordered by you personally. I was there at that time, but I, I was not the commandant of the unit. I was the high-ranking person in Hargeisa. Therefore, it was necessary those commanders to consult with me and uh, to, to have direct directions from myself. As you know, the top person in the area of conflict should give the last okay. Yes, I give this okay. How to use tactically, how to employ the units. It was my task to, to, to give them uh, directions and the directives. Quote, yes, I give this okay. How to use tactically, how to employ units, it was my task to give them directions in the directive. Unquote. That admittance of responsibility was going to become very important in the court case, in the way that it explained Samata's involvement of the way that the Somali armed forces killed and looted livestock, they blew up water reservoirs, they destroyed homes and tortured, imprisoned and summarily e executed civilians accused of supporting the SNM. And this included businessmen, teachers, high school students and, and simple farmers. So it seemed like a simple um, open and shut case, right? Nope. The amount of twists and turns that this case took is amazing. You see, it, there was a slight problem, not necessarily with the evidence or the testimonies, but a problem with whether or not Mr. Samata could be sued at all for any of his actions during his time in office. Why? The Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. The FSIA establishes the limitations as to whether a foreign sovereign nation or any of its political subdivisions, agencies or instrumentalities may be sued in a US state or federal court. Now, Mr. Samata argued that this applied to him as he was acting in an official capacity for the Republic of Somalia during that time. And thus, he should be given immunity. So, in January 2005, the court case was put on hold to give the State Department an opportunity to weigh in on the question of immunity. The court requested that Mr. Samata provide regular updates on the State Department's position. Now, day after day, week after week, month after month, for two years, for two years straight, Mr. Samata reported each time that the request was under consideration by the State Department. So, the district court judge subpoenaed documents from the US government. But the Bush administration, who was in charge at the time, objected, objected to all attempts to enforce the subpoena, stating that the US government wasn't bound to the subpoena. The plaintiffs appealed this decision, and the appeals court agreed that the subpoena can be enforced on the State Department. So that's good news, right? No again. They didn't get anything at all. So, two years after the original request, on January 22, 2007, the court case was taken off hold and the proceedings were reinstated. But then came the clincher. 
the former vice president of Somalia filed another motion to dismiss, arguing that he was shielded from civil liability by the FSIA. Now, now you have some background on this, you can see why he would want to use it, right? So, three months later, on April 27, 2007, the district court granted this motion. The court held that the FSIA provides immunity from civil lawsuits to foreign states and to their agencies and instrumentalities, which includes him. So the plaintiffs were barred from bringing suit against Mr. Sumata, making him immune from any civil suits. I mean, if this wasn't real, you'd really think they're taking this straight out of a script from a movie. But they didn't give up. They appealed this again, this time to the Fourth Circuit Court. The question of whether or not the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act applies at all is a two-part question. First, the individual has to be a foreign official defendant who qualifies as a foreign country for purposes of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. I don't think he does because, number one, individuals, I, th I would argue, are not, are not within the intended rubric of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act at all. I think the... Well, I think that the uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is very clearly and by its language designated to foreign states. There is an existing common law immunities that uh, history in our country that uh, the United States government has argued um, applies properly to individuals in both the statement of interest that the government submitted in the Mater versus Dictor case and in an amicus brief in the Second Circuit in the Kensington case, the U.S. government lays forth a very compelling outline of why the government's position is that individuals are not even covered in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. It's like an in inconsistent position handed over history as to whether or not individuals are covered by FSIA. Um, the government uh, has done so in individual cases by weighing in with sort of suggestions of immunity and suggestions of interest. And I, part of the reason we have a Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is because Congress tried very hard to codify what was an existing common law scheme and to make the decisions be more consistent. Okay, so one position is that the language of the act does not encompass individuals. What about as, as a practical matter? Obviously, the argument's made that states can only act through individuals, but if you don't give immunity to the individual, you're effectively denying it immunity to the state. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? I respond by pointing out to the court what is, I think, the core and most important thing I would like to leave the court with today. And that's that certain acts are never sovereign acts. Certain acts do not qualify uh, uh, for consideration. You're saying torture is not a sovereign act. That's what I'm saying, Your Honor. Torture and extrajudicial killing. I, I, there is a, those are not acts that can be officially endorsed by any country, that can be ratified by any country and qualify as an official act uh, for purposes of invoking an immunity. You see, what they did was they used the case of the Roman Catholic nun as reasons for why this shouldn't apply. They had a precedent, and the Fourth Circuit Court agreed. Now, two years after being granted immunity, the original civil suit was back on, or we thought it was. See, Mr. Samata appealed that decision and went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court to review his case. But the plaintiffs had some help this time making the argument that Mr. Somata shouldn't be given immunity. On their side, on the Supreme Court level, where the U.S. government, members of Congress, former U.S. diplomats, former U.S. military professionals, the foreign minister of Somaliland, Holocaust survivors, and groups doing anti-genocide work, human rights and religious organizations, experts on Somali history, and highly respected law professors in the U.S. I mean, honestly, the backup that they brought looked like they were ready to go to war with this. And it helped, it really did, because in 2010, after much deliberation, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed with the Fourth Circuit Court that the former Prime Minister is not shielded from being sued by the FSIA, holding that the FSIA does not immunize individual officials. And they decided this by a unanimous 9-0 to zero decision. I mean, they all agreed. So, the case was sent back to the district court again. And once it was back in the district court, the former vice president filed a motion to dismiss the complaint, again, arguing that he was entitled to common law immunity and head of state immunity. Now, I know it sounds the same, but it's not. There are two different types of immunity here. So he didn't get the first one. And because he couldn't get the first one, he then tried to get the second one. But it didn't work. The State Department, and they rarely do this, the State Department intervened and stated that he was not entitled to immunity and pretty much 
straight away the district court ruled the same way. So, nearly eight years after the suit was filed, the trial was finally going to start. It was scheduled to begin on February 21st, 2012. February 21st. Now, after filing and losing two more motions to delay the proceedings, on the evening of February 19th, two days before the trial date, two days, the former Vice President and former Prime Minister, Mr. Samatar, filed for bankruptcy, which meant that the trial had to be delayed automatically. Now, an emergency motion to lift the delay was won on February 21st, and a new trial date was, for, was set for February 23rd, so two days after the original one. And finally, the trial began. And once it did, it was short and swift. I mean, after eight years of trying to argue that he shouldn't even be sued, once the trial was allowed to commence, it was over really quickly. I mean, on the morning of February 23rd, Mr. Samata personally appeared in court to enter his default and to plead guilty, conceding both liability and damages. Now, there were some other things that needed to be sorted out, but six months later, the plaintiffs were awarded $21 million in damages, and it was all over. Now, even though they had won the case, and it's highly unlikely that they'll receive much if any of the awarded money to, was to be given to them, because obviously he filed for bankruptcy. But for them, they said it wasn't about the money. It was about seeking justice. And the road to justice may be long, but justice will come. Now see, we will discuss the impact of this court case and the final bits after the ruling was made, because this is really, really important and it hasn't really been covered by the mainstream media. I mean, some of the, the US newspapers covered it, but that was about it. But you don't really see any of the mainstream Somali media covering this. And this is really important because it really goes into the depth, the heart of everything that is going on between the relationship between Somalia and Somaliland. But we'll discuss all of that after the break. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to the briefing room. And just before the break, we were discussing or we were covering the court case for Mr. Samatar and obviously the suit that was filed against him uh, in terms of getting some sort of justice for the actions that he was responsible for uh, during the atrocities that happened in Hargeisa uh, during the period of 1988 and for the majority of the 1980s really. Um, so in terms of what this means, what do you think? I mean, I, th I think firstly, it's really important just to acknowledge how significant this case is. This is the first individual who's actually been brought to justice in some sense, even if it is outside of, uh, uh, you know, of the, the region itself. Um, but, but nobody from the Siad Bara um, government regime or any regimes that followed that have, have actually been um, accused of war crimes. So I think it's really interesting that this is the first time that it's happened. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not this will perhaps give other people the courage, other victims of uh, any of the crimes uh, that did happen uh, during that time, during the downfall and collapse uh, of Somalia, to see if they'll be, you know, willing to actually bring their cases forward and whether they're going to happen, is that, whether that's going to happen in the U.S. or elsewhere. Um, I think also it's kind of interesting to see how the Somali federal government has almost handled this case as well. Now, obviously, there was the whole issue of whether or not Samatar was going to uh, seek immunity. Uh, and obviously that helped him delay the trial for about two years um, as it was constantly just under consideration. Um, but, you know, the pr then Prime Minister, um, Shardon, actually, you know, wants to support him in that. Um, so, so for me, it's, it's qu quite interesting to see how the administration actually handled that because, you know, the President Hassan Shah had, has, you know, in the beginning of his term really stated uh, the importance of human rights, um, how he wanted to ensure that individuals were actually held to account for their actions and really wanted to see uh, Somalia move forward um, from the atrocities of the past. You know, and, and then within a few months of you know, US recognition, they're already you know, supporting uh, this individual seeking immunity. So I think that's a massive disappointment. Um, and it really does say a lot you know, about the Somali uh, federal government's actions as opposed to their kind of flowery rhetoric that they've been using. But does it, does it, does it show what they believe? Do they believe, you know what, okay, the past is the past, then we should then try to move forward. You know what, let's just give this guy immunity. Or is this what their stance is on uh, anything related to or going towards Somaliland because I know the talks are going on right now um, but in terms of being able to get 
some form of reconciliation to happen between these two nations, uh, whether it's going to be a working relationship mm -hmm. or however this relationship will move forward. Before any reconciliation, there needs to be some form of justice. Um, so is this going to be their, basically their, their, their policy towards some island and say, okay, yeah, guys, hey, it's happened. I know, you know, okay, no, we acknowledge, we don't, we don't apologize, but we acknowledge. But at the same time, you know, if you guys try to bring anyone from the former governments to justice, ah, we'll, we'll try to get them immunity, you know, we'll try to get them off the hook. It doesn't matter what they did before, let's just all move on together. And is this, is this how it's going to be? Is this everything going to be brushed under the carpet? Well, only time will tell. I really hope that we can move forward from this kind of superficial acknowledgement of things. You know, it's been going on for the last two decades. It's about time that we have those serious conversations and we're able to actually, you know, look at reconciliation seriously. And I don't think it's just about accountability. It really does need to go hand in hand with peace building. And that means having to, you know, kind of dig really deep and open up and have those really difficult discussions um, and, and, and see how, you you know, we can move forward. And I don't think that's going to happen if they constantly continue, uh, you know, supporting these war criminals. And, you know, at the end of the day, there are individuals across all regions, from Somaliland to Puntland uh, to the current administration, who were actually associated uh, with the Siad Barai regime at the end of the day. So, you know, what will happen if we're going to have, you know, this uh, system of kind of holding these people to account? Does that mean that those individuals that were associated with the former uh, administration are also going to step down? Um, and stand trial um, so that we can kind of start afresh or are we going to kind of just dismiss those leave them in the past and start afresh well from a from a perspective of being able to be objective uh, when trying to do this if there are individuals that are currently uh, in Somaliland or in certain high positions of Somaliland, I mean, a lot of people have said Dahir Yale, um, a lot of people have said, obviously, I know Sinanya was quite influential in the SLM itself, but there seems to have been some history before that as well. Um, and they say, oh, by the way, they just sort of turned coats and they switched to the other side. But before that time, they were involved with quite a lot of atrocities themselves. And even during that time, um, they were involved for a lot of atrocities themselves. Is this going to be sort of the stepping stone to say, okay, guys, if we're going to bring anyone to justice, it, it's not just anyone from uh, the, the central government in, in Mogadishu, but is it always also going to be anyone who's currently in the administration of Puntland and in the administration of Somaliland? Um, and what roles that they have played? I mean, if we're not going towards this, I know it's good to, to get the big boys first, but there were other people involved in this. So if we're not going to move forward and say, guys, okay, on both sides, it's, we've really got to look at this and say who's, who was accountable. And if you were accountable, and one of the things, for example, that's really difficult to prove right now um, is that anyone who wants to get involved in politics um, can't do so if they have been convicted of war crimes. But no one's been convicted of war crimes in the whole country, so really and truly anyone can really get involved in politics again if they want. Um, but what they haven't said was obviously if... Uh, in particular, if the war crimes have to be criminal charges or civil charges, because in this case, he's not going to prison. Uh, not necessarily, unless obviously for whatever reason the bank bankruptcy uh, evolves into something else. Mm -hmm. But this was a civil suit. This was a suit that was just to show, look, okay, fine, he did admit it. And after eight years, I mean, it took him eight years to get from where this, the trial was supposed to start to the trial actually starting. And when it started, it was just all over on the same day. He just came in and said, hey, guys, you know, it's fine. I, I admit it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I did order that, and, and I, am, I am liable. I don't want any of this to continue. I know some of the reasons that he gave also was about the money, that he didn't have anyone to continue covering this, um, and that's why he filed for bankruptcy. Um, he was using an interpreter during the court case, um, and obviously just to make sure that, okay, fine, it's, if you are because he said, I, I, just, I just want this whole thing to end. It, 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 the eight years was too long for him. And, and the judge asked him, the judge asked him very clearly, you do realize that by admitting your guilt right now, um, you will, this won't stop any further proceedings, as in further proceedings can still happen. But he just wanted to just close the chapter because at the end of the day, he fought it, he lost, and he realized, okay, I'm not going to get anywhere with this. But if he then decides to uh, suddenly go back to Somali politics and get involved again, because he wasn't convicted in a Somali court, does that mean that it doesn't apply? Um, or does it only apply in Somali courts? Or does it apply to any court that they were convicted of? And does it need to be a criminal charge or civil charge? And how many more people are we going to do this uh, with? And I'm surprised because I know the, the, the Somaliland foreign minister was involved in this, obviously, of, uh, at the time. 
And I haven't really seen, uh, as for, for lack of a better term, much hoo-ha about this. Um, and I'm, I'm re that's, that's the part that really surprises me, that something that's so huge, something that's so important for everyone to be able to look at objectively and say, okay, look, guys, we all know that this was wrong, for people to still be able to take different sides and for one side of the government to say, uh, for, for, the, for the Somali federal government to try and help him in his immunity case um, and for the Somaliland government to then afterwards not use any of the, the court's outcomes or the results of this um, for any further actions. This to me seems a little bit too quiet. I don't know why nobody's really talking about this. And this, when I when I saw about this, I, I I couldn't wait to obviously cover this. And I wanted to make sure I, I, that that we covered it and we did it justice. Um, kind of way ju doing justice, justice. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's I, I don't see why it's not. Do 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 you think this is part of a a bigger thing that maybe we're not noticing that they're working towards or? Is this even going to come up in the reconciliation talks that are happening right now, do you think? Are they even going to talk about it? I mean, firstly, I'm really disappointed to, to know that the Somali media really hasn't followed this story quite closely. Um, I don't know if it's because of the length of time that it's taken and perhaps, you know, people weren't really that interested because it was happening in the state, so it didn't really seem that relevant. Or if perhaps as a people we're just not ready to have this discussion. You know, we're emotionally not there. We still want to turn a blind eye to what what, had ha what happened in, in the past. And once we're ready to have that conversation, perhaps, you know, interest will pick up. Now, you mentioned, you know, a scenario if Samata was actually to return uh, to Somalia and wanted to get uh, involved in politics again. I think at the end of the day, it's down to, to the people. It's down to the communities if they're willing to accept him and bring him in with open arms or if they're going to say, no, we refuse to have you return to politics and, you know, tarnish the name of our government. We don't want you involved in anything think um, to do with with our government and we don't want you representing us because you don't um, but so but 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 to jump in there and sorry that I did but it's we have examples from before for example when uh, Sheikh Tahir always was whether you want to believe uh, that he was captured arrested or whether he gave himself up but he was welcomed with open arms it, the people from the government themselves MPs went to go to and and and, and welcome him open arms when he came into Kismaya and you no know, they had a whole party for him and it was basically anyone that had some sort of affiliation towards him whether it was clan based or anything else went to go open him up so why wouldn't they do the same for Mr Samata look I, I think it comes back down to the root disease that Somali people are facing you know our issue is you know tribalism at the end of the day and and our tribes if you know one of your fellow clansmen has been found guilty of something that doesn't mean that you're going to ostracize him from your community in fact you guard him and you protect you know uh, the, the rest of the public from kind of attacking him um, so, so that's the thing and that, that was the, the case um, you know similar with the case that you mentioned so it's really done to us to you know forget about our clan affiliations and really look at things um, you know morally uh, and, and really use uh, use our moral compass because the Somali people do have that so you know it, we need to be really careful about how we implement that and impose that on other people it can't just be you know when another clan has done something wrong to you that you hold them to account and you completely ignore the ills of your your own clansmen so i think until we move past that uh, you know we're going to be stuck in the same situation for another 20 decades do do you think that now this has happened i know we touched on the point of that it might happen with other people um but i think the most widely mentioned name in terms of all of this was general morgan mm -hmm. um do you think that anything will happen towards him or is, are people still going to protect him or do you think that you know what yeah it, they might take him to court anyway i think following this court case we may possibly see um you know his uh, uh, people coming for him again um whether that's going to happen um in the international arena or within somalia time only time can tell but i think uh, that that would be the major case and uh, probably the next one to follow in see, my opinion I'd, I'd like to i'd like to say yeah, let's let's just you know let's just try and take all of these guys to the international criminal court. Um, but I don't really have much faith in the ICC themselves. It's the whole issue about them just only trying to prosecute Africans. Yeah. And I'd much rather that we solve this in our own courts. And the true te the true test of the maturity of our justice system as as it's going on right now, um, it hasn't really passed in terms of the way they handled the the, the rape cases and and these kind of things. But this was a, obviously a very particular topic and very particular section uh, of, of crimes. But when it comes to historical crimes and war crimes, I'd, I'd be really interested to see how any of the Somali court cases would handle this. This, this would be, if this ever happened, honestly, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be watching this day in, day out, uh, trying to cover it sort of every night. Um, so it would be amazing. But 
that's all we have time for for today. Um, if obviously you have any other questions, or anything else you want to get involved with, uh, get, get involved obviously, you can get involved via the, the website of Star TV or get involved via Facebook. Um, my name is Abu Hamza, with me is my co-host Samira Ahmed, and you guys have been watching The Briefing. Thank you very much and have a good evening.